open our sermon notebooks. Thanks, Ross. Good morning. <clears throat> Thanks for inviting us and me the privilege to talk, preach. I can't bend that back any further, so I'll stop trying. <laughs> Uh, I think this morning it'd be better if you, I'm not sure, didn't read the Bible. I know that's counterintuitive. Like, I think that always we say, look, keep looking, see verse 2, see verse 3. Oh, don't do that today. Just listen. I mean, that might be, might sound a little pretentious, and it probably is, and I'll probably change my tune by the next service. But anyway, we'll see how we go. Today I want to do... Um, channel Paul, maybe. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm going to be Paul, and I'm going to be talking Ephesians talk to you. And I want this not to be a doctrine lesson, which, um, which Ephesians is pretty jam packed full of doctrine, and so I want it to be more than that, much more than that. Hi from my scratchy pen in the Roman prison cell to all you wonderful saints in Hornsby Heights. Did you catch that? I called you saints. Now there's a word. How becoming. I bet you'd never thought you'd be called a saint. How is it even possible? I, I get ahead of myself. Let me start again. Hi. In case you don't know me, I'm Paul. I'm one of Messiah Jesus' apostles. And lest you think I'm big noting myself, a self-appointed spiritual scam artist, and there's enough of them going around these days, let me tell you, well, I'm not, and I didn't. I didn't volunteer for this job, that's for sure. It was God who gave me this title. Hey, but it's way more than a title. It's a job. It's a glorious job at that. More of a vocation or even a calling. I can't believe my luck. Hmm. Maybe I should stop using that word. Anyway, <clears throat> it's so wonderful to be writing to you guys. I'm imagining you all there gathered there on Galston Road, faithfully following Messiah Jesus. How wonderful. How strange. There mightn't be many of you when it comes to numbers in that irreligious city of yours. But God has you. You are God's people. Out of all those around you, he chose you, not them, he chose you to be his, just like he chose me. God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ are so good to us. I pray all his kindness and his peacefulness to settle into your hearts. Let it sink in deep, friends. Oh, we can't praise our most high God highly enough. He is the Father of our Master, Master Jesus, Jesus, the promised Messiah, he has done so much good for us. Did I say that already? Well, let me brighten it up a bit. I'm about to let you into a little secret. Not a little secret, a huge secret that will make it impossible, impossible for you not to praise him. Friends, get this one into your brains and your heart and you will never look back to the fading substitutes for our great God. Wait for it. God has set us up with every, and I mean every, spiritual blessing to be found in all of heaven. Are you confused by the word spiritual? Are you thinking crystals, yoga, unicorns at this point? Well, get that out of your mind. Think of it as personal, full of meaning, significant. The things we really want out of life, not the fleeting good stuff we generally call blessings like good weather, money, decent internet, air conditioning, but the stuff that God calls good, like getting to know him, having a relationship with him. It's a total life transformation far beyond our average ordinary. God has the goods to give us that. And his warehouses are jam-packed. They're jam-packed with everything it takes to make that possible. This doesn't come cheap. It happened in Christ. 
Getting pure God into us dirty and dull earthlings is no mean feat. But where there's a will, there's a million-year plan. God always had in mind to send Christ to make this happen, and now it is. We're living on the right side of history, folks. So how does all this work, you ask? Well, it's amazing stuff. Let's raise our grateful hearts, first of all, because he chose us. I'll say that again. He chose you. Little words, huge reality. You might have missed every team selection and job promotion in the history of the world, but universal Yahweh put his finger on you, and not just as some sort of afterthought selection out of pity for the loser class of the Shire. No way. He put his big tick on you before the creation of the world. Is this starting to sound a bit far-fetched to you? Well, you bet it is. But ponder it anyway. God thinking of non-existent you a billion years ago, you a twinkle in God's eye before there was a twinkle of any sort anywhere. And how did he convert that twinkle in his eye, which was you, into you, the horns behind chosen ones? I'm glad you asked. For him, it was no problem. He set up the whole of creation, then history, so that Jesus would appear in the world at just the right time to die and then do the impossible and rise from the dead. Rise from stone dead. And then do the even more impossible, seal the deal for you when you weren't even looking for a deal. That's longhand for in Christ. Why did he do it? Well, there's an easy answer to that one too. Love, in love, out of love, for love, for the love of you, God loving you. Now, I realize this might be a bit hard to get, but he had a reason for setting his loving eyes on you. Wait for it. So that you could be holy and blameless in his sight. Tempted to roll your eyes at that holy talk? Well, consider the alternatives. Dirty and shame-faced guilty in his sight. You want to be that? Like most of Sydney who are looking at the cosmic god down the barrel of a gun? I don't have to tell you who's going to come off second best. But forget, forget them for a moment and think of you, holy, blameless, the brightest, shiniest billboards in the universe, advertising love. That's you. So to recap, blessing number one, he chose you. Now for blessing number two, he predestined you. What does predestined mean? Well, it means he chose you, only with more intention. He laid out your destiny ahead of time. Let me be clear. Like we say over in Vanuatu, well, like they say, you didn't pull his eye. It wasn't your vast intellect or startling beauty which got you, so to speak, on his books. He got you on his books, not you. He did it because he's so incredibly kind. He did it because he wanted to. Radically free agent God totally willed you into his limelight. And wait, there's more. He didn't appoint you to kick around the edges of his glory. He adopted you. Blessing number three. Ever wondered what it, what it would be like to be royalty? You're in. A son, a daughter of the king. And it only took the birth of the universe, 4,000 years of recorded history, and the deadly obedience of the beloved son of all beloved sons to get you in. Not wowed yet? Well, I'm not giving up that easy. Let me try another tech. You guys were goners. You were flotsam in the universe, suburban scumbags, no hope, no God in the world apart from those toy broom broom gods your countrymen are so proud of, like Artemis, the lady god of the Ephesians, was so proud of. I don't want to be rude, but your gods really haven't advanced all that much above her carved statue fame. Artemis didn't exactly have a good track record for defending her supporters. Look, guys, don't hanker for gods that need to be propped up. Yes, they're enticing for sure, but you won't find salvation there. 
So, no hope. You are children of wrath, as I like to say. This is bad. But God, the wrathful one, poured out the fullness of his fury on his beloved. Incredible, I know. But it saved you. Your rage-inducing rebellion put aside. You forgiven, just like that. Blessing number four, if you're still counting. Well, I said a bit back, it didn't, he didn't exactly save you just like that. But he did do it in keeping with his inconceivable character. So blooming, rich and free and undeserved. I want to say incredible, but I've already used that once or twice. I'm running out of words. No, whatever. I'll say it again. So incredible as to be unbelievable. I can't think of a better word for all of this than lavish. You know what lavish means, don't you? Extravagant, wasteful, over the top. I keep thinking of whipped Whipped cream standing full and fluffy over an overflowing bowl of triple chocolate, 100% fat ice cream. Lavish. Did God go mad? No, no. He did his lavishly kind choosing, adopting, saving and forgiving, knowing exactly what he was doing. He plotted it with a wisdom you and I can't even dream of and then spun out the stars and the rest is history. History made for you. Oh man, I could go on and on. I learned an awful lot of mind-blowing stuff during those three years in the desert, you know. For instance, all this plotting and planning stayed hidden for so long. Even my ancestors, the people God first called to be his own, well, <clears throat> called to be his own, well before he adopted you and knocked me off my horse, even his own people didn't cotton on to what he was really doing. They thought it was all about them. And then all that mystery was cleared up. The Messiah, the promised one, his, that his people thought was going to come to their rescue on a white horse, came to their rescue riding on a donkey to his death. Now that's a mystery. I've explained it before, and to add to the mystery, a wonder of wonders, you tin and brick-loving Gentiles got included in the family. Can you believe God took pleasure in doing this? So much rejoicing in heaven when a sinner takes up the offer. Pleasure, so much divinely decadent reveling in lavishly serving sinners, and then calling them saints. Just the thought of it gave God pleasure. What kind of a God is that? Not dreaming up torches for anarchists like little gods do, but chuckling over the shockwaves his homemade Christmas present was going to send through the world. Ah, but let me remind you that though you reap the blessings, the real focus is that death-embracing son of his. It's not you. It's not me. It's him, the son, the Messiah, the dead center of history, soon to, becoming the li to become the living end of the world. What a plan. This obedient son who gave every scrap of his godhood to save, <clears throat> to save dump dwellers will be seen at the end of time to be, to be, well, everything. The sum of all things, everything in the heavens, everything on earth, animate and inanimate, I imagine. He's going to bring them all together. He's going to restore everything to order. And if you think about it, part of the disorder in the world is us. So a big part of getting order back is to make friends of us. And then we can make proper friends of each other. Oh my goodness, this is doing my head in. If I knew it was good for me, I'd stop and give you a break. But there's more to be said. More things to be said about this blessed, these blessed blessings. But maybe we will just pause for a sec, lest somebody falls out a window. Um, and then we'll forge on. So can you turn to your neighbour, if you can get close to one. Well, you might have to do a bit of yelling. But anyway, can you turn to your neighbour and talk for a minute or two about physical versus spiritual blessings and why one is so much more mind-blowing than the other? I'll just give you a minute.
Okay. Did one come out on top? Good. Well, I want to say at this point that <clears throat> you and we, is that good grammar? You and we are in this together. You Gentiles and we Jews. True, we Jews had a bit of a head start. A number of us were the first believers in the Messiah in a way that God intended from the beginning, i.e. to set our hope on him, to bank on him alone to bring us to the side of God. But look, that's no boast. We get on the good side of God in exactly the same way that you Gentiles do. Heaven has only one design. There's only one plan, one pleasurable plan, and only one agent to bring that plan about, Jesus. The plan set our destiny just like the same plan sets your destiny. Yes, and the end game is the same for us Jews too, to acknowledge that we had nothing to do with the plan or the outcome and join together in billboarding our unimaginably magnificent God. Do you remember the day that those fabulous, un in undisputable, indisputable words of truth hit your ears and became the good news that saved you? You know, the, you know the day when you wholeheartedly took on board the message of the Messiah? Do you remember that? And to assure you that all this was true, that God really is working on your behalf, he moved his Holy Spirit in on you? Remember that? The Spirit is God's unique signature promising you that the new chosen out saved life is the real deal and that it will survive the test of your trudge through life and survive the test of the coming judgment like welcome good and faithful servant you belong to me come in and take your inheritance boy that'll be nice i'm waiting for that are you but it's a while away yet for most of us so let's get down to the present business of highlighting the wonders of God. That's what we Jews were saved for. And that's what you Gentiles are saved for now too. So how are we going to keep on trudging? We don't want this to be a long, boring, meaningless trudge, do we? How are we going to keep the lights on and shining? Well, to help you, I want to pray some pretty heavy things for you. Things that will really keep you maturing and thriving as God's people there in Hornsby Heights. I know you guys a little bit. I've heard some of the great stories about you, how you came to believe in our Lord Jesus and how that's brought about real transformation in your lives. I've heard how you really love each other. Well, that's a rather unusual thing in this every man for himself world of ours and a real sign that God really has reigned his full warehouse of spiritual blessings on you. Yes, they, they've really got you, those things really got you connected to the Most High God in a most wonderful way. But you don't want to stop at that and wallow in smug, in-group satisfaction, do you? Like I said, I want to pray for you. Firstly, with thanksgiving. Everything I've heard about you makes my heart rise to the Lord after all. It's he who's done all this, and it never ceases to amaze me. So now I want the Father, our gloriously impressive Father, to help you keep growing in your understanding of him. He has opened your heart eyes to see Jesus for who he is and become obedient to him. But that's just, that's just the start. You'll be spending eternity getting to know God, so you might as well get a head start. You know, the whole world is looking for a glimmer of hope to resuscitate them. But the things they latch onto just don't cut it. So short-lived and disappointing. But God, in setting his favour on you, has put a hope in front of you that will blow your mind. The wealth that awaits us in our inheritance will be nothing short of stupendous. Can you hold on? 
How will you not faint on the road? You won't, you know, because you know what? God is strong. Maybe you think he's not enough for your doubts and your temptations. Maybe he's not up to the demands of your 21st century life. Okay, ponder this. Think of the power that he exerted over every force of nature to raise Jesus from the dead and then exalt him to the name above all names. Now that's power. And it's that very same incredibly great power that he's wielding to keep us on track to reach the goal of our salvation. I'm praying that you'll see it there offered to you with open hands and that you'll grab hold of it and live in the immenseness of it. Jesus is up there above every government, every ruler, every regime, over every angelic or devilish force that ever has or ever will flex their puny muscles. You, my friends, are in safe hands. And just to cap this off, and to give you a confidence that you are indeed on victory's side, God has put every single thing under that Christ's authority. Get this, the supreme Christ belongs to us, to us, the church. We're his body. He is our head. Together we're one. Shake your heads over this one. In one sense, God regards Christ as not fully full until he's joined with the people he died to save. That's you and me. Do you crave significance and purpose in life? How could we be possibly be offered more? Totally thought of before time. History managed for our salvation. Perfect son of heaven killed and raised to purchase for us an unshakable and rich inheritance. Holy Spirit to seal the deal and now somehow joined all of us together with the fullest thing in the universe, the one that fills all things. Our little church in Hornsby Heights, how great is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For now. Chapter 2 is coming. <laughs> for us now uh, we normally have question time so I'm going to invite Ross back up and uh, if you have questions uh, you can ask them I'll repeat them and then I'll hand over to Ross Sally Uh, so um, Sally's just asking, um, Ross made a comment about incompleteness and uh, Sally's just wanting some clarity on that. Yeah. Um, obviously Jesus isn't incomplete. He's the fullest thing in the universe. <laughs> um, but there is, a, there, there is some sense in which I don't know, not enough words for it, I don't think, it, it, is that he's, um, he takes his place in the universe when he takes us, the church, on as his head. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. I mean, that's where I'm, that's where I'm getting it from. So, yeah, obviously, sorry, what, um, Obviously not incomplete, but made completer? No, you can't say that. <laughs> I don't know. It, somehow fulfilling his purpose in the Trinity by being head over the church? Yeah, I think it's just, um, just one of those things that, uh, one, one of those parts of the Trinity that, that can make our hearts sore, but then um, unravel them when we try to work out what it means.
Yeah, so the fullness is, let's say, Christ could have existed by himself without the church. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit could easily have, I, I don't even think, even think you can say this, could easily have existed by themselves, lapping up their own fellowship without the church. But in saving, in saving the church, that, that was the whole goal and destination of history, but to the, save, but to the, to the praise of his glory. So without the church, yeah, the, the uh, billion-year plan would not be a complete, full thing. And so that, that is part of Christ's fullness. So on this theme, looking back to Psalm 47, verse 11, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. How can fear and love Uh, how can fear and love coexist? Perfect love drives out fear. Yeah, good. I, I remember um, John Piper has an illustration of this. I remember some way back. He, he, if I remember it rightly, he says it's like it's like you stuck in a shallow cave with a massive storm whipping around you. But you're in the cave, like it's it, it, you're you're totally awed by by the fury of what's going on around you, but you're as safe as anything. Um, so I think, I mean, you know, people have tried to say respect or those sorts of words. It's a it, it obviously with a God that can pull all of that off and pull off all of creation. You can't just say, hmm. <laughs> pretty nice must have done it for me I'll just revel in that <laughs> without without like if he if he came to you like he passed by Moses or like he came to Isaiah or like Peter saw all of Jesus I mean everybody that's everybody that's had a, a close encounter is like flat out I mean they're just fall down because but uh, I think our problem and my my problem is that we and it's really what I'm trying to get at is trying to build in myself a sense of this magnificence that we live in front of and then try to respond to it appropriately thanks for listening thanks Ross uh, friends uh, we're gonna finish